Havdalah. For some of you, it's the highlight of your Shabbaton. For others, this may be your first NCSY style Havdalah. And yet for others, this may be your very first Havdalah ever. What is Havdalah? What is the power of Havdalah? Havdalah means to separate, to make a distinction between Shabbos and the rest of the week. And we stand here in this moment and we too get to make a distinction. Like Saul spoke about that mezuzah yesterday that we put on the doorposts because it symbolizes transition. Havdalah is a time of transition where we get to make a choice. As we walk out of Shabbos, are we going to leave the inspiration, the conversations, the connection, the questions, the answers behind and close the door? Or are we going to walk through that doorway and take it all with us? Havdalah is a time of choice. In Hebrew, the word for choice is bachar, bechira. The word for teenager is bachar, a bachar, a bachura. Because you, in this moment of your life, are making choices. Choices that will determine your future. In these short formative years of your life, you will set a path, a trajectory for the rest of your life. I'm going to be very honest with you. When I was your age, I didn't make a lot of choices. My life was laid out before me. But I had parents who made choices before me. My mother and my father grew up in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> they went to Eastmore High together and started dating at the Ohio State University. Io! <laughs> my father was born to Arthur and Ethel Ireland. Amazing, wonderful Christian parents. He was a truth seeker. He had a sensitive soul. And it was a time before Ish.com, Chabad.org, Torah Anytime, before the internet. I think color TVs were just on the market. But he was on a journey. And when he was a few years older than each and every one of you, he made a choice. The choice to become a Jew. And that one choice that that one person made impacted generations. It impacted me and my siblings, my children, my nieces, my nephews, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and every generation to come forever. A few blocks away from my father, my mother was growing up, but she was growing up in a totally different world. She didn't choose to become Jewish. She's a child of Holocaust survivors, born to Esther and Herschel Sluzer of blessed memory. They both survived the war. They had spouses and children. They went through the hell and the horrors of Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz. They lost everything and everyone. And they too had to make a choice. And they chose to rebuild. They met each other at a DP camp in Germany and they got married again. They had their first child, my uncle Victor, and a couple years later moved to the United States to Columbus where my mother was born 
and a few years later, my uncle Jacob of blessed memory. My mother didn't have to choose to be Jewish, but she had another choice. When she was your age, she lost her father. She was 17 years old in high school, and he passed away from cancer, and she was left alone because her older brother was struggling with substance abuse, was in trouble with the law, and was barely home. Her younger brother had Down syndrome and diabetes, and she was his main caregiver because my grandmother wasn't well. She was agoraphobic, which means she was afraid of people. She would never, ever leave the house. My mother never heard happy birthday on her birthday. She never once heard her mother say, I love you. In a different way, my mother was like her parents in the fact that she too was a survivor. And she had a choice to make. And she chose not to be a victim of her circumstances. She had every excuse to be jaded and cynical. And she chose to be strong and to survive. And because of my mother's choice and my father's choice, I didn't have to make those tough choices. I was raised in a loving home, went to a beautiful school. I think the first hard choice I had to make was when I was a senior in high school. I always wanted to be a doctor. I was going to be an optometrist until 12th grade when my Chumash teacher walked in and I saw her living and breathing and loving the Torah. And it ignited a passion within me. That's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And when I went to my year in Israel in seminary, I realized I had a choice to make. And I knew that I would probably be disappointing my parents. But I sent them a letter and I explained that I had to change my hopes and my dreams for my future. They wouldn't have the daughter who was the doctor. I wanted to be a teacher of Torah. My parents secretly were extraordinarily disappointed. My mother would tell me later she thought I was making the biggest mistake of my life and selling myself short. But that's not what she told me then. Both of them supported me because I think they knew what it was like to make a choice and not have support of those that you love. But it wasn't the only time in my life that somebody was afraid I was making the worst decision of my life. Only a few short years ago, I was told again, when I was making the hardest decision of my life, that it was going to be the biggest mistake I ever made. When I became that teacher, I felt like Saul did. I couldn't believe I was getting paid to do what I loved. I got a paycheck. Now, I didn't get to buy a sports car with my paycheck, but it didn't matter because I was teaching and loving Torah, and I was fulfilled until I wasn't, until I heard growing frustration and discontentment from my students who were doing everything right. They loved being Jewish. They were coming from good homes. They were keeping everything they were supposed to keep, following all the rules, keeping Shabbos, keeping kosher, learning Torah. They were doing everything and feeling nothing. Rev. Aaron Feldman said a number of years ago that we're raising generations of teens that are so observant but are not religious, which means that we're going through the motions but there are no emotions. And I heard this from my students who wanted to feel a connection to their Judaism, who knew intellectually that it was right, that it was good, but there was no soul. And I wanted to help, but I didn't know how. I tried it adding programs and more programs and learning, and, and I was putting band-aids. And I wasn't solving the problem, and a voice started to grow that said, you need to start a new school. But it wasn't the voice of my students, 
and it wasn't the voice of the parents that were calling me. It was my own voice. And I said, no, 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 no. I can't start a school. Do you know who I am? I'm Rachi. You know what Rachi is? It's, it's Rachel. You know what a Rachel is? It's a sheep. I'm a sheep. I'm passive. I follow the leader. I stick with my flock. I am not about to step outside of my comfort zone and ruffle feathers or do something independent. And I quieted that voice, but it only grew louder and louder. In a second attempt to quiet that voice, I reached out to mentors, rabbis and teachers in the community, hoping that they would tell me, let it go. You're wrong, you're crazy, don't do it. The problem was, every single person I went to said, you're right, it's a need, do it. But I knew in that moment, even though I had clarity, it wasn't enough. I was being told, you're stupid, you're crazy, who do you think you are, you foolish little girl, stay in your lane. I had clarity, but I also had fear. False evidence appearing real. That's what fear stands for. And I truly understood in that moment that there is nothing to fear but the fear itself. Fear will hold you back from doing exactly what you know you need to do. And that's why it's so powerful, and that's why it's so dangerous. We say every morning in the Birchos HaShachar, we bless Hashem for giving the rooster the ability to discern between day and night. Who cares about a rooster? I don't. And even if I did, what's the big deal? It's not hard to discern between day and night. But I realized that sometimes, even if it's not hard to discern between day and night, we can have the knowledge of right and wrong, but we still need help because we can be paralyzed with fear. And I had to take a step back and question, why am I here? We know the right thing. I had three students in my office this week because they also had to make a choice. They're seniors in high school and they have to choose what school they're going to next year. And they have the blessing and the curse of being accepted to multiple scores. And they have to choose which school to go to. They each came into my office and they said, tell us where to go. Make the choice for us. And I said, no, this isn't my choice to make, but I will listen. And as they began to talk, each of them on their own, it became clear that they knew exactly what they wanted to do. And I said, you have the answer. Why are you here? What do you need from me? You've got it all figured out. They said, but if I choose this school, people will judge me. They'll say I settled. I could have done better because they don't know. My other student said, because if I choose this school, they'll say that I've starked out. And they'll think that I'm a, a faker because they don't know I'm not the same person I was in ninth grade. And I kept hearing over and over, we know what's right, but we're scared. We're scared of other people's opinion of us. We're scared of failure. And sometimes maybe we're scared of success. They needed permission to trust themselves, to make the right choice. And I'm going to tell you what I told them. Trust yourself to make the right choice. You have the clarity. You know what to choose. I'm going to leave you with two words. This is all you need to remember. Be 
brave. Your life depends on it, and we need you.
Oh 